Live from the zone, this is Derailed Trains of Thought. Hello, Timothy. Hello, Nicholas. Oh, so this is interesting to be on this side of this thing. I know. Like, I was really deep in thought to brainstorming about uh, a certain story of mine that you may have heard of before, and suddenly I, I showed up here. I'm not even sure if the podcast brought me here or if something else yeah. did. I was at home doing some some thinking about this uh, project I'm working on, and yeah. I guess it's, it's podcasting time. Yeah, there you go. Right here. We're in this, like, sea of blue stuff i know it's a little it's a little dark seeming but it was really fun getting here yeah it, definitely um although you look really different from uh, last time i saw you yeah i don't know why that is we're a little more uh cartoony yeah uh we got cute little actually we're, we're pretty adorable we're nice yeah 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 we show up on animal farm or something <laughs> yeah so anyway it's kind of chill out here and in, in uh what'd you say this was called the zone the zone the zone okay well, welcome, listeners. Welcome to Derail Train the Thought, your premier podcast for the consumer and the creator. That's all about storytelling. Yes. <laughs> this is episode 117. And back home, it's feeling very spring-like. Uh, that it is. That it is. Although, you never know. I feel like by the time that our episodes actually come out, the weather could be completely different. Hopefully even warmer. Well, yeah, hopefully it goes that direction. Yeah, in Indiana, who knows? You, you never know for sure. It could be snowing. <laughs> oh, let's hope not. So, Tim. Yeah. Let's go to story school. All right, so this is a topic we've done parts of before. But we just felt like we had enough to tackle again. Well, and this has been on our topic list for a little bit, and neither one of us is quite sure who <laughs> originally put it on there. But we felt ready to tackle it. Yes. And given that uh, we're kind of getting the spring, we thought it might be good for some spring training for creativity. So this episode is all about kind of helping prepare ourselves, train ourselves to be creative, to use our imaginations, to... Unlock potential dun, dun, dun. for only seven ninety nine in three easy payments, <laughs> or from your podcatcher wherever you downloaded this episode. Yes, but this could be a useful thing for creatives and uh, consumers of stories. We are surrounded by creativity in various ways, and it's easy sometimes a mistake just swimming in story to actually being creative yourself. Yeah, it's very easy to just saturate yourself in pop culture and constantly be entertained with TV, streaming, video games, Memes. books. Yeah, all, all the flood of entertainment that seeps into our everyday lives and feel, yes, I am an artistic genius because I have watched or seen or read or and listened to all And I can quote everything. Things. Yes, and I can quote everything. But just because you... And don't get me wrong, obviously consuming stories is a great thing, but... Otherwise, we wouldn't have half this podcast. <laughs> That's true, because we pro we ourselves probably do more, spend more time in the consumption of stories than actually creating these days, which is unfortunate. But ideally, we should be doing both. Yes, and all, and I think we were saying that all people should probably do both. Yeah. I mean, obviously, not everyone's going to be, a say, a, a writer... A filmmaker. A filmmaker, whatever. A video game designer. But you will use creativity in some manner, whether it's just rearranging the house or how are you going to arrange your lifestyle. I mean, there's all sorts of things that um, moving outside the normal box might be very beneficial. A project for the community. It basically, I mean, the creative spirit is something that should be fostered. It's obviously a very important part of storytelling, but also just in life in general. We, we are not meant to just constantly be taking in without giving out and basically helping make the world a better place. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but there's truth to it. It's a cat poster, but it's true. <laughs> exactly. As uh, as quoted by the the Lego movie. And and as we've mentioned in some other podcast, you know, from a, our Christian point of view, one of the first things we learn about God is that he's a creator and then he makes man in his image. Yes. And so it's certainly something that man is specially able to do this sort of being creative. It's, it's and make things for culture, go and, you know, populate the earth. Go and do likewise. Yes. Yeah, agreed. So to start the spring training, Tim, 
Yes. Say say we've just we've just got through winter and we haven't done anything. We've just been getting fat on um stories. On WandaVision and yes. Disney Plus and Mandalorian and all all that good stuff. And all the movies that have been coming out. Oh well. well hmm. Okay. <laughs> been a leaner year. <laughs> yes. So how do we go from being a couch potato to a uh to a creator? Well, I guess the first thing is like what you would do if you're getting ready to go exercise practice yes you go into training go lift that okay but what, what does that look like for creatives or for exercising some creative muscles can i throw a random sidetrack in here just that already we just started i know and you can take this out but i just thought it was fascinating when we were doing some looking around for this episode the fact that scientists have found that imagining doing exercises actually makes your muscles stronger yeah which again has nothing really to do here i just think that idea of the practicing imagination matters a lot because the way your brain processes stuff affects your entire body apparently okay, if, assuming this is a repeatable thing i believe it because i've heard that when you're creating a, ba- a habit or, mm-hmm. or a bad habit or a good habit whatever it is the more often you do a certain thing apparently from what i've heard and i don't have the scientific reports to back this up but i heard this through the grapevine that those habits will actually create pathways in your brain so literally, the more you have a habit or an addiction or something, it more physically becomes a part of who you are. Your thoughts actually wind up rewriting you in a way. So what you're saying is if you practice being creative, your brain might naturally become more creative. Uh huh. Just like practicing any skill, it becomes a more natural part of you because it is physically being written onto your brain. Yeah, our, our uh, psychosomatic whole is amazing. Yeah. What you said. That means mind, body, unit. We are. Yeah. Okay. You said Yoda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So anyway, so how do we start practicing? Well, I think I w- this would be a good time to talk about a certain John Cleese lecture that you and I recently listened to. Yeah. So John Cleese, if you don't know, shame on you. But John Cleese was one of the members of the Monty Python troupe. He's also known for Faulty Towers, which is a great, like, six-episode <laughs> British TV show and various other he was things. A, he was a guest star on The Muppet Show. Very funny episode. So, yes, comedian, actor, but also a um, has some very interesting insights on the process of creativity. Yes. So we listened, and I don't even know, I had heard it ages ago. And so for this, I'm like, oh, I'm going to try to hunt that down. I found some random YouTube video of a guy. I don't know if that's the – it's not the official one. Um, but he gives this lecture – Basically, it sounds like to like managers at like like business managers. Uh-huh. And one of the first things he mentions that there are basically two states. Um, one is the closed state and one is the open state. He says that most people spend most of the time, and he's talking to these business people, in the closed state, which is the, I got to get stuff done. It's just facts, in and out. Very so direction-based, like, here's my checklist, I have to go do this, and then this needs to get, then this is done very objective-focused. Yes. And he says it, it's good mode, everyone needs this mode, but it's hard to be creative in that mode when you're like, I just got to get stuff done. Right. And so part of creativity is, when you go to the gym, you don't usually wear your khakis and your dress shirt from, your wor- from work. You got to change into your sweats or whatever you wear. And so you got to flip into the open mode, which is this more free-flowing... Kind of a play mode. A play mode. Yeah, I think that will, yeah, it's it's very playful. It's very not, it's not work. Yeah. You have to be more, well, I guess, open-minded, being willing to throw out ideas and, you know, as what we would do on this episode, brainstorming. Brainstorming. It's basically, you don't have to feel like you have to have the right answer. You just have to, like, come up with various things and be willing to experiment and toss ideas around in your head and just be open about it. And I think that's one of the more, one of the, important things if you're not used to being creative is that nothing's wrong. Like, mm. I, and I tell people sometimes, you've heard it from me, I know sometimes the students when I'm saying stuff about helping their poems or their short stories, like, I'm going to just start throwing dumb ideas out. And like, some of them are going to be like, no, that's, why would you ever do that? <laughs> but that's okay. That's part of what happens because sometimes those dumb ideas match with another dumb idea and voila, whoa, I never thought of that. Uh-huh. You know, I'm actually reminded of another video talk I remember seeing when I was in high school. Uh, It was kind of this Great Courses-esque thing about preparing for college. Okay. And he was saying that 
the habit a lot of high schoolers get into because they've been doing this throughout their elementary years is becoming like a robot. Mm -hmm. they, they, they once the teacher gives them the junk, they spit it back out on the test or in their essay. Basically, tell me what you want me to know and say, and then I'll re say it, regurgitate it yes. right back to you. Whereas true learning has to in involve more steps like it has to like how does this relate to what i've already learned you're and how do i process it yeah you're synthesizing disparate elements and that's a much of creativity is you're taking things that may not go together and seeing will it work will it work does it blend will it flow will <laughs> it flow okay uh. <laughs> and i think obviously a lot of that is just like being okay with and it was interesting. I have never felt this, but John Cleese mentioned for some people, this is kind of has a sense of anxiety. Mm. This sense of like, I just need to figure it out. Which basically means that someone's having a hard time moving from a closed mode to this new open mode. Yeah, you need to be open to just basically just trying things and not necessarily even at the end of your time having an answer. You know, one of the most interesting things he said, which I had not thought about, he said that play, I don't remember who he quoted, one of the definition of play it had a beginning and an end time. Like it wasn't open ended. Oh. And I thought that was really interesting. I never thought of that. But he said, at least for his, what he was telling all the people there, was that you should set aside a certain amount of time that has a beginning, has an end, and that when you're at the end, you can go back and start getting stuff done. Uh -huh. So the open state shouldn't actually be indefinite. It should have a beginning and end. Is yeah, that what you, yeah. Okay. And, and I just I thought that was an interesting part of it because sometimes you just think, oh, I need to just be open until I figure something out. He's like, mm. no, you just be open for a right amount of time, have your brain stop worrying about the laundry or whatever. Yeah. And then at some point you just cut it off because he says your brain will keep working. It is interesting. And the time thing is, is I thought, the important ing next ingredient to go into. Because obviously if you're going to have this period of open-endingness, you're going to need to have give it enough time to do it. And he, he commented on like, don't go for just half an hour. It may yeah. take you just a half an hour to quiet all your racing thoughts down so you could actually, you know, be open-minded, mm -hmm. open-ended in this. Uh, give it at least like 90 minutes, I think yep. he suggested. Which for some people, that's quite a time investment. You really yeah. have to set aside a chunk of time. And I think this is, if you're going to talk about any kind of practice, workout, yeah, you have to set aside time to do it. You're not just, you don't just, uh, oh, I'm, I'll pick up some books on my way uh, from the couch <laughs> to my bed. Yeah. <laughs> you need, a, no, you need, you need an actual set aside time to do your creative workout. And uh, it maybe it'll just be an afternoon on a Saturday or something. And like he said, he's, you know, it's much easier to do the, the less important thing that's urgent than the more important thing that isn't. Yeah. And I, I completely understand that. Setting aside time to be creative is not easy when there's a million other things mm -hmm. that you should just get done or you feel like you should get done. Yeah. And I guess part of that practice of stretching your imagination muscles is give yourself time to do it and say it's okay not to, you know, to push off the other things. The other things. And it's not, I guess that's an important thing to think about. It's not as if you're procrastinating on other things. You are placing a great importance on this act of creativity, which as long as you're not doing it for bad motives, like ego sort of yeah. thing, it's probably honestly a healthy part of, if, especially if you have a creative urge like a storyteller, yeah. that's a healthy thing to, to set aside time for. And I think this, obviously, we're talking a lot of times in like a story issue or a character or whatever, but obviously, even if you just have like some problem in a job situation, where, you know, having that time to sit aside and be creative about what are my options. Mm hmm might be helpful. He pointed out like in a work setting, like if managers don't want to, he got kind of satirical toward the end of his talk. If managers don't want to encourage creativity in their workplace, then you need to keep your employees on task at all times and make sure that they're, they, they've got plenty of busy work to take care of. And I could identify that. I mean, I've, I've, I'm in a pretty nice work environment right now, but I've been in other ones where it's like, yeah, I could see how like certain entrepreneur types people are not necessarily creative minded people even though they think they are mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah it takes a bit, little bit of time to get into that mindset and you yeah it'd be a, a challenge in any space to sometimes to convince a manager of that i know for a while google had i want to say it was their 20 percent project or rule or something where they would basically want their people to all take a section of their time a week to work on their own project mm -hmm. i think it was their idea of like look we'll foster all sorts of more benefits for the company if we let them be creative. Explore, see and what I they think, come up with. And I think there's a lot of projects that came out of Google during that time that were just pet projects. Mm. 
And it kind of reminds me, so many years ago, there's, I don't remember where it came out, I think Sheffield, England, but this idea of the Christian, uh, the kind of rhythm of rest and work, and my pastor picked it up and was talking about it, and it was, it says, instead of resting from work, we should be working from rest. And I think you having those sections of, you know, that time apart could be kind of a similar idea, the idea that to get stuff done, you need that hour and a half of just sort of, you know, letting your brain figure out the problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another interesting thing that he said is that, at least for him, and I think it, it makes sense in a lot of cases, that humor is part of creativity. Mm-hmm. Just that being able to laugh at stuff, being able to look at things from a, you know, a unique point of view. We all kind of have that idea that humorless people are stodgy. They don't have a lot of creativity. Mm-hmm. But I think it's interesting, and he didn't say this, but it seems that what they share, both humor and creativity, is that both of them, and I need to define this after I say it, are both kind of transgressive. And it don't necessarily mean that, like, they're transgressing some moral boundary, though both of them can. They can, yes. I mean, humor does. But they transgress just your normal, your box. To think outside the box, you have to cross the mm-hmm. line. Mm-hmm. Humor tends to purposely run around outside the box. Or lateral thinking problems. You ever done lateral thinking problems? Yes, actually, I was just thinking about lateral thinking because my college and career Sunday school teacher, who was a huge influence on me, he was a, an attorney himself. And mm-hmm. So he, it was interesting. He tended to think very logically because in the law, you have to do that. Mm-hmm. But he started off his Sunday school classes with one, a poem. Nice. Because he said, these help you think on a different level, in a different way. Yep. They kind of, they use language in a way that's not just precise. It's in a, this kind of lateral thinking mm-hmm. area. And then he would also start off with a lateral thinking puzzle. Oh, those are great. Yeah. And, and you know, it was the kind he would like, let us students ask questions, usually yes or no questions, yep. to try to ha- kind of get to the answer of the lateral thinking puzzle. And it's, it was, I think, a really useful way to start a Sunday school class. I mean, Sunday morning, no one's quite awake to really yeah. <laughs> engage in this level, but it gets gets the brain thinking in terms of, okay, how do, how do we think outside of our little box, American bubble, and... Then in a Sunday school class, in that case, you would apply it to studying the Bible or thinking about questions of theology. And that reminds me, Cleese mentioned um, Hitchcock, that whenever they were trying to solve a problem and they were getting too hard or they're arguing, he would just suddenly tell a story, like an unrelated story. And it just made the other people mad, like, we're trying to solve a problem. But it was that sort of intuitive, like, look, we're not going to solve the problem by coming at it. We've got to in some ways, wander around it. Yeah, we got to we gotta get outside of it and come back to another thing, and which makes total sense. How many times have you just toiled over a problem and not been able to find a solution? Then it's like, okay, put it aside, come back, and then later maybe the answer will come to you while you're in the shower exactly. or something. Yeah. Like, there's, isn't there like a form of like, it's not a dry erase marker, but something that lets you... Oh, like right in the shower? Right in the shower. I think I've heard get, that. Yeah, they get because some people do some of their best thinking in the shower because yep. you're occupied with some other task and it leaves your... There's something about the way we use our brains in terms of like multitasking is not necessarily a healthy thing, mm-hmm. but and yet at the same time, there's certain small things we can do to occupy one part of the brain that kind of helps free up the rest of the brain mm-hmm. to, to mull over an issue. Yeah. I mean, that's one reason why people listen to music while they study, or yep. and you can brainstorm in the shower or while you drive. Yeah, exactly. And tell me if I'm missing anything. But then, you know, basically, so you, you set aside time, you let yourself just do as many crazy things, you know, just throw things against the wall, and the time's up, you end it. Move back into the closed and, mode and, to get things done, and then and, maybe... And, and then you have to go and get stuff done. Like, you can't just hang out there. I think some, especially younger creatives, tend to just want to hang out in the brainstorming era forever mm-hmm. because it's nice and fun and abstract. wibbly wobbly. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to actually commit to anything yet. Mm-hmm. But, you know, at some point you just you just do it. You just go with it. And, you know, you don't have a solution yet. You just let it sit there and you go on to do something else. So, Tim, say you're doing this, ex- say you're doing this imagination exercise. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the hardest part for you? Uh-huh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I knew we'd get to some of this eventually because I was like, when we were thinking about this topic, I was like, okay, this is going to be a good topic, but man, it's going to be a bit humbling because <laughs> I probably need work on some of these things myself. I guess for me, well, two things. One, the regular rhythm of it myself because mm-hmm. uh, I uh, talked about the dangers of being a couch potato, but if I'm honest, I have some you know dangers of being coming a ta- couch potato myself. Mm-hmm. 
So there's there's that getting into a regular habit of giving myself time to just the empty space, basically mm-hmm. to the think and the process stuff. But then, like you just said, moving from that empty space, the times when I do have that, just kind of lingering there forever, and then not actually going to act on that kind, of, mm-hmm. some of those ideas. I've talked about a certain story of mine many, <laughs> many times. Uh, I, actually, just this last Saturday, I was doing some brainstorming about it, and I will say I was able to. <laughs> I stepped out of the shower, found my, myself preoccupied by it, and was like, "Okay, I'm going to go write out some notes." And so I wrote out a nice little paragraph, and it's really just notes for myself. Really, but still, yeah. But still, it's like I felt like. I had accomplished something. It's progress. It's progress. It's something I've been doing some world building here. So yeah, th- I guess those would be the, my two things. How about you? Right now, it's really it's really the time issue. I find myself, now that you have these terminology, I'll say in the closed mode more often between so got the two jobs and just juggling. You know, it's very rarely I get, I get to the end of the day and then I don't have the time to, you know, that half hour, whatever you need to flip. Mm, mm-hmm. At least during the week and sometimes the weekend, but just it's, that's the hard thing right now. I realized, I mean, I've said on the podcast, I'm sure before that, obviously driving is a great way for me to get in the open mode because I don't have to do anything. Music is a great way for me. Walking, the most frustrating thing for me sometimes is I'll take a walk real to the late night, like 9, 9.30. I'll get back. I'll be like pumped to be creative, except then it's like time to wind down and go to, you know, for me, uh-huh. get, get start moving towards bed or get the last things done or whatever. Not quite, but I mean, I don't have the, it would have been great if it was like two o'clock in the afternoon. Sure. You know, right. sort of thing. Right. I think that's a lot of it. I've always been pretty good at the like just throwing dumb stuff against the wall. Yeah. And I think we've we've had a lot of fun doing that here on the podcast with yes. brainstorming stuff. So yeah, I don't know that so probably our, our weaknesses are similar time right now. Yeah. yeah. Although yeah, well, yeah, just getting them out of time. I mean, I think you've done pretty good when you do have the time to be able to transition from uh, think about this forever. Oh, no, I'm going to write this thing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I've taught myself. I think part of that's me teaching myself to overdo it in a while. And I think part of it's just my personality is having been originally more of a workaholic. You just sort of, mm. it's easy to flip into that, let's get this thing done yeah. mode for me. See, and, and I've always been very motivated by deadlines, mm-hmm. obligations, things. And so when it's just a for fun project, sometimes it's I have one story that I'm thinking about for over a decade. And yep. <laughs> I mean, I got those too, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think those are all really good ways to practice. I guess the other thing is like, if you find, you know, find it important to be creative, like working out and there's something I need to know is like, sometimes you got to find the time, you know, set aside on purpose. Right. Um, and again, the managers, you know, this part of their job to be creative in how they approach the their job or hiring or, or the direction of the company. So they should set that apart. I mean, like my brother, if he was on here, he'd read all kinds of business books about that sort of That sort of angle. brainstorming. Yeah. 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 So yeah, the intentionality of setting aside that time and those are all important things for the, your exercise. I think another thing that might be useful to talk about here is also your diet. Ah, yes. In terms of, obviously, what you eat may, can determine how much you're going to lose weight or mm. get fit or whatever. On a creative side, this goes into the consumption of entertainment again. And I do think it's sometimes we can get very satisfied with eating junk food. Mm-hmm. And what junk food is may very much depend on the person. Maybe that means you watch way too much reality TV. Maybe you spend too much time watching YouTube, Let's Players, or I don't know, you know what your junk your food, comfort habit food is. is. Your comfort food is. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, certainly. There, but I guess the question is, is what you're consuming, well, one, is it unhealthy for you in terms of like, as a Christian, yeah. there are certain things that are not healthy for us to view. Yes. Um, because of sexual content or even, you know, certain amounts of violence or, you know. Or even worldview if you're susceptible to that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, very much so. Are the stories you create full of truth or are, are they you, have a lot of yeah. lies in them? And then I think you're also, are you also saying then, obviously there's ones that are harmful spiritually, but then there's also ones that are not helpful creatively, uh, creatively, <laughs> there you go. Cr- creatively? Yes, uh, sure. <laughs> in a way, I think if there's a certain danger, if you always go towards your favorite sorts of things, then your mind kind of falls, your storytelling ideas just falls into ruts. And like, even when you're brainstorming, you may just wind up spitting out similar tropes to what you've constantly be, been seeing. Because I guess, you know, the one of the hearts of creativity is juxtaposition, chain, putting new things together. Uh-huh. And if all the thing, all your tools are 
the same, mm-hmm. it's hard to put new stuff together. I remember reading, like, I think it was Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, one of them. They never read fantasy novels. They write fantasy novels all the time. I think it was Tracy Hickman. But, like, he never read any of them. Partly because I think he judges them differently because he writes them. But also, I think you just get a different perspective reading other things. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure my fancy novels are different because I read Dostoevsky. <laughs> That's true. You That's know? probably very true. Um, now, I get there is a balance to this. I mean, because we've also talked about how it's impossible for everybody to consume everything. Oh, yeah. You shouldn't. Yeah. I mean, it's totally fine if, like, there's, if there's a certain thing that really speaks to you that you really love that you really want to grok that's totally cool to, yes uh, I, I love the fact that we could get that word on our podcast like all the time <laughs> I, I, it's it's finally it took me a couple of times but it's finally seeped into mine new listeners if you don't want to know what grok <laughs> is uh nick give them an explanation uh, grok is to know something so well you could it it's from a stranger strange land from a robert highland novel um just to know it so well you could almost like if you grok language you can dream in that language it's like to fully imbibe it Right. So, yeah, if you're really into Star Wars, like like, like we have historically been, it's totally fine to be able to learn oh, all yeah. the all the characters and planets. Read all and, the books and everything. And yeah. <laughs> but hopefully you're also in your entertainment. And obviously we've been doing this kind of stuff for years. So yeah. <laughs> there's no rush to like feel like you have to, you know, know all there is to know about a fandom with a certain amount of time. But at the same time, it's it's healthy to get in some literature, some whether you're reading or or some other kinds of artworks. Well, and I think also just keeping your eyes open, just like to real life. Like you could love Star Wars, and then you're just walking around and you know how people act, you uh, know the different scientific technologies coming down the pipeline. Mm-hmm. Like so much of say Ray Bradbury, you can tell that he just saw something and he decided to write a story about. It. Like oh, he saw a lighthouse and heard the horn and. Going right with the foghorn, you know, it just having we've talked about this in the everything is story episode. Mm-hmm. That if you have a certain eyes, you can see a lot of different ways you combine, say, your garbage pickup with some alien race. I mean, I, I don't know, <laughs> I'm just throwing things out there, but yeah. Well, the one thing going back to Mr. Cleese, he talked about a lot of humor comes from juxtaposing two different things, but like it's not just that because a computer could make random associations yes. that don't make any sense. Yeah. But if you're able to kind of compare one thing to another, here's an example from Monty Python, which he didn't talk about, but I thought about when he was talking. Uh, so there's that one Monty Python skit where the philosophers are in a soccer match. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's that's funny in part because on one level, it's just a goofy juxtaposition. Yeah. But there's also enough similarities in like philosophers hashing out the battle of ideas yeah. to a soccer match. There's a bit, you know, there's not just a completely random correlation. Mm-hmm. There is just enough of a correlation there that that's kind of funny. Well, have you seen the one where the like the different communist leaders are on a game show to win like a, a set of furniture? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like it's the same. And that ability to combine two things and then make it not just, oh, it's quirky, but like say something. Mm-hmm. Be like then it's about winning this like material furniture set, which is like, not communist at all. I mean, game show in essence is not communist. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, and I think just the ability to both see it and then say, oh, I could do something with this. Uh-huh. I was thinking today, my, my wife was at a, this is how my brain work, a secondhand store. Like, not secondhand, but like one of those stores where like it went to the normal store and then didn't sell. So it's all the leftovers and so they discount it. Kind of a thrift, thrift store. Yeah, kind of, kind of, yeah. Thrift shop. Um, like an Ollie's if you're in the oh, fucking area. Sort okay. Of thing. Yeah, I know what you mean. Okay. Um, not quite thrift as if it's, these are not used. They're things. not they're used. Just, they're just like leftovers or extras. The or overstock. Over, overstock. There you go. Yeah. And I thought like, what if you could buy like overstock time, just like discounted time from people who don't care about <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't even know what to do with it. But uh-huh. so I'm like, I need to write that down for a story. That is interesting. Just throwing yeah. random things together. Uh huh. I mean, and that's, I think that's the difference between, say, Monty Python and something like Family Guy, which people have, there's a joke about Family Guy, which I haven't watched in years, but I remember hearing a joke where, like, I think South Park made fun of it, which I've never watched either. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this works. Where I think in South Park, they said, like, they would have random ideas that they would, 
throw on a ping pong ball and then they have dolphins that would just randomly hit out ping pong balls and they make references to things and somehow that was funny yeah uh, <laughs> so it's not just the fact that oh it's a random reference that's so funny because it's so random and unexpected no the idea is that it's yeah there has to be a meaning to this the something and it's like and, and i mean as you get stronger in creativity it's not just necessarily the first thing that works mm. sometimes it's saying okay that's pretty good is there something better uh-huh and is there something better? And again, at some point, you have to just call and go with it. Right. And if you're drawing from a healthier diet of stories mm -hmm. or real life experiences, you're going to be able to make more and different connections that mm -hmm. are stronger and more impressive. This or, is, you know, or more meaningful, I guess I should say. It's not no, about being just about being impressive. No. You know, this is why, like, a lot of my podcasts I listen to tend to be more Christian oriented, but like, every once in a while, it's nice to have one like 99% invisible that just introduces me to stuff. I would never have heard about anywhere else. Yeah. It just expands my horizons way like, oh, there's, if you don't know, 99% Invisible is a... Well, we've been talking about it a little bit, but... It is a design podcast, technically. But they talk about all all manner of design and... Uh, they are very creative on that show. They are. And they don't really bring up a liberal perspective super often, but it is enough there. It's like, okay, this is kind of their background. Kind of like how we're... We're not really a Christian podcast, but we can't help but talk about our Christian beliefs as yeah. we talk about the things we talk about. Exactly. So it would make sense. And so, yeah, it's healthy in a, in a sense to have, to be able to hear from both sides. Because if you just live in an echo tunnel, yeah, your arts and your creativity is going to suffer. And honestly, your own understanding of the world is probably not going to be as complete as it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to hear from people we agree with and people we disagree with yeah. and they help us get a bigger picture of the world. So I think that's a pretty good um, regimen to get started on. Yeah, it is a good regimen. So as you break into spring, there's some ideas. Maybe we've helped give you some ideas of how to uh, give yourself space to be creative. Uh, maybe giving you some ideas of how you want to trim your the diets of things that enter your brain. With that, I guess, Tim, we'll go to our soundtrack. So I picked this song for soundtrack for a couple of reasons. One, it's from a Animal Crossing game, which Animal Crossing games give you a lot of opportunities to customize the Just town. Do your, th do your thing. Do your thing. You can make some pretty cool things from it, from what I understand. And I think it's very, I mean, it's very like not like get stuff done. It's very like open. Well, it depends mode. on who you talk to. I well, okay, my, my daughter is very much like, oh, I just wander around and catch a fish. And <laughs> yeah. Isn't there uh, loans that she has to pay off? Well, yeah, something? but she's like, whatever. I mean, yeah, Tom <laughs> Nook the Kingpin. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, and then this particular remix is from uh, Animal Crossing New Leaf, the Nintendo 3DS iteration, which I don't think we've done this particular Animal Crossing game. This remix is called uh, Morning Jazz. It's by AJ Desprito. And jazz is probably one of my go-to brainstorming music genres. I love listening to jazz in the car. And so I think this song is a good example of that. Hope you enjoy. Thank you. 
Do you wish you were more creative? Of course, we all do. Who doesn't want to produce witty characters, surprising plot twists, and stunning worlds? If you're a writer, and who isn't nowadays, then you know that the key to your success is creativity, creativity, creativity. But really, who has the time? There are a million other grubby so-called creatives out there trying to steal your place in the limelight. You have to move fast. You have to capitalize on the moment. You have to get that story published. Now. That's where the cutting-edge app Amanuensis comes in. Based on the same AI technology that undergirds Google's auto-suggest, Amanuensis has been trained on all the world's most important works. Everything from Gilgamesh to Gilmore Girls, and on every story from Alibaba to World War Z. Its intuitive design means that you can spend your time crafting works of art, not struggling with nested menus and obtuse forms. Simply start typing, and Amanuensis will do the rest. If you begin with the words, it was, Amanuensis will prompt you with possible next words, things like the best of times and the worst of times, and a period of civil war in the galaxy, and a dark and stormy night. You choose the one that your artistic genius feels is the best, and then you just keep typing. It'll continue to suggest the best additions to your story, and you just continue to choose what matters to you as a superior artistic being. In no time flat, you'll have an original work ready for Amazon's bestseller list. It's so easy, even a child could use it. In fact, listen to this sample created by five-year-old user Billy Pulowski last night when he should have been doing his math homework. Once upon a time in West Philadelphia born and raised, Ulysses lived in a hole in the ground. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single marsh wiggle in possession of the once and future king, must be in want of a green eggs and ham, he mused. Life is a box of the thing with feathers, replied Jack Bauer Shepherd Black Bee Nimble. He lived in soil and green and had never played Quidditch before. I have a bad feeling to infinity and beyond, answered little orphan Annie Karenina. Along came the man in the iron mask and yellow hat. His name was Rosebud. The truth is out there, he shouted. Inconceivable, said a rabbit that was also a codfish. My love is a play told by a little prince full of sound and fury road. The night was dark and stormed the castle. Boom. And he almost deserved it. Amen. And amen. Don't spend another minute staring at a blank page. Stop hurting your brain and start using your head. Unleash the creativity of millennia of humans' greatest achievements for a yearly subscription of only $29.99. Purchase Amanuensis today in the App Store. And welcome back. Hello, I hope you enjoyed that, folks. I did. It was it was nice and calming. Short and sweet. Yes. All right. It is now time for <laughs> What if? It's been a while since we've done what if. Yeah, it, it seems like we're talking about creativity, we gotta. It's a good fit for it, I think. We want to do something a little different than just like our normal. Obviously, it'll be, it's still what if. Yes. Which, what do we do in what ifs normally, Nick? We usually make up some sort of situation and say, what if this was true? And then brainstorm. Uh-huh. And we've done everything to like just making up where fictional characters go for vacation. Or made, we use nouns or... Movie titles? Well, we combined movie titles one time. There's another one where we used a random noun generator to make a character's outfit. Oh yeah, that's true. Yep. And one time we did love, we brainstormed an entire story. Yep. What if is a nice place for... Uh, well, experimenting, open-minded so yes. kind of stuff, or uh, open, also, I keep forgetting. The just word. open state. Open state, there yes. we go, of just throwing all kinds of ideas around. Uh, so today what we're going to do, we've decided that we hunted down this random story arc generator on chaoticshiny.com. I know nothing about this site, but we we're looking for some sort of, we want a story generator that wouldn't give us too much information, but Enough not to so get us vague. started, yeah. yeah. So this gives us a vague story arc, and what we're going to do, we're going to, Pause the recording. Like, you guys won't hear us brainstorming. Give us some time to actually think about it. We're individually going to come up with a story 
detail. We're going to flush it out. Yes. So the idea is we want to see if we can come up with, for each prompt, we're going to see if we can come up with five unique stories based on just that prompt. Because the idea of creativity is there's no bad thing, but you just keep throwing things against the wall. So mm-hmm. I'm going to come up with two. Tim's going to come up with two, and then we'll work together on the last one to come up with a super version. Although I think we should each work on one, and then we'll re-record and, and tell each other that that one story. Yes. And then we'll come do a, a second one. So then they build off each other, yep. in theory. All right. All right. So in editing, each time that we break for uh, our brainstorming, you're going to hear the sound. How's that? That sounds great. Okay, good. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so ready? Here we go. Uh, no. Well, we need to hear our arc. Oh, yeah, we do need to hear. Okay, what's what's our prompts that we're going to start so with? So I, I refreshed it from the last one, so we've not heard this one. All right. An arc revolving around a maternal figure, which starts with an escape and involves a farmer. Okay, an arc is surrounding an... Maternal. Maternal. Yeah, some sort of motherly figure. Okay. Which starts with an escape and involves a farmer. Okay, well, let's see what we come up with. Okay. All right, Tim. So I just threw stuff out. Exactly. Same Same here. It's like, uh, it, I, it, it's, it's the pressure is definitely on. I'm like, there's a little bit more of a, uh, we've got some more breathing room than when we were just doing uh, the spewing thing that we did for Challenge Accepted a few yeah. episodes back. Uh, but it's still four minutes, which is the time limit we gave ourselves. It's not really a lot of time to... The fine tune, but you know what? That's okay. We're, yeah, we're doing... just yeah, I know. I'm like, this sounds dumb. Just go. Okay. So what do you have? All right, here we go. So I have a daughter afraid of the mom's magic. The magic is used to control people, and the daughter begins to doubt whether even she is truly doing what she wants freely. The daughter doubts whether she's being controlled or not. She doesn't know. Oh wow. Okay. She doesn't think she is, but she doesn't really know, and she's realizing, huh? She decides to escape from the manor they live on, avoiding all the servants who make who work for her mom. She's like, they can't stop her. And at the border of their land, their realm, well, you know, it's like a large manor, I guess. She decides to turn back, thinking it's silly to even doubt her mom. And then Tara runs through her. She's like, is this really my thought or is this something pro- programmed in myself for my mom to make sure I don't leave? Whoa. So she begs the farmer who's leaving the farm from delivering something. I don't know what. Turnips. That. Um, <laughs> to tie her up and take her. To just basically kidnap her. Wait. The- he wants to far- she, she begs this farmer to kidnap her, basically. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and he does, for he's actually a representative of a rival r- wizard come to spy out the mother's area. Wow. Okay. And that's this is gonna be interesting because you went in a very different direction. <laughs> and you went very, uh, which I like, very cool fantasy. Almost, I could I could see Neil Gaiman writing a story that's like true. that. That's true. Honestly, in his whimsical mode, the art, the art that came in, and all I could think of again, I have daughters. Uh, um, uh, I could only think of Tangled. Ah. Uh, okay. And then I'm like, but I don't want to write Tangled, so I just went with it. Cool, I like it. Okay, for, for some years. for some reason, mine went in a in a dark uh, historical fiction Ooh, sort of let's, territory. Let's it. So it's and in some ways a little too straightforward. But a mother and a daughter escape a Nazi concentration Ooh. camp and run across the German countryside, trying to avoid recapture. A farmer hides the two in his barn overnight. The following day, he helps smuggle them across the countryside toward a nearby port town, but the farmer gets stopped for questioning. So the mother and daughter have to slip into the woods nearby to escape capture. They make a harrowing journey the rest of the way to the port town and the ship they hope can smuggle them out of the country. Nice. You know what's interesting? We both have basically mother-daughter and a farmer that hides them. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like the, de- again, that's the that's the default creativity with the farmer, I think. Yeah, yeah. It seems like if it's an escape and then there's a farmer, he seems like he should be on a bad. I guess you could write it in a way that the farmer was an antagonist. Yeah. But it's interesting. That's kind of where our, both of our minds went. Although you're, you went in a fantasy direction, and for some reason, my first thought was... Uh, well, that's what, that's what we're doing here. Yeah, exactly. All right, so now we will use that same prompt. And we'll each try to come up with a completely different version of... Using the same prompt. Yeah. All right. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, I used all my good stuff already. Let's go. <laughs> okay. I think I have a very interesting one, but the time limit was working against me here. Yeah. Mine's, I tried to go very different I did on t- purpose, but I, did I don't know that it played to any of my strengths. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I'll do mine first since yours is interesting. Okay. Go for okay. it. So I don't even know enough about animals to do this one. So this is like sort of a, like a Disney animal sort of movie okay all right so chloe is farm willer's sheepdog all the animals on the farm listen and to and respect her she's the maternal figure this dog okay even colossus the meanest biggest bull on the farm 
But when Colossus escapes during the storm of the century, Chloe goes after him over river and field, um, trying to bully him to return to Farmer Willard's. Along the way, she enters a harsh world far from the loving respect and care she has back home. Okay. So it's one of these sort of like adventure things, and then she's learned to deal with all the wildness, and he, and apparently Colossus the bull doesn't want to come back. And, okay, so yeah. kind of like an uh, animal, it's kind of like a Homeward Bound. Kind of like that, yeah. Or Benji's Yeah, so, or, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> you should ask my sister sometime about, they were watching a Benji movie, and Dad came in and saw them all crying, <laughs> and like, what's going on? He's like, what are you, why are you watching this? <laughs> Nice. So I, I I went with the uh, try to do a different farmer thing, but I don't feel like this is very unique as a story. Okay. But yes. All right. So yeah, I went in a completely different genre here. Good. Um, Queen Naptalun of Neptune is horrified to discover her arch nemesis Quatrob has escaped his prison cell. She worries for the safety of her species because Quatrob's people have been at war with her people for millennia. Indeed, the first of Quatrob's victims on his escape rampage is an innocent farmer who was murdered in his repulsor lift stolen as Quatrob runs from the queen's forces. She soon decides the only way to protect her people is to go undercover and find out the truth about how her enemy escaped. Nice. So, I like that one. <laughs> so I thought, okay, what if the escape is actually a bad thing? Yeah. And, uh, and plus, I went with completely different genre by setting it on Neptune and yeah. all places. So. Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> all right. I like, I like, these are very different stories. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of fun. The, point. The, yeah. the whole point had the exact same prompt. Okay. So now this time we're going to do our, our traditional live brainstorming yep. thing and see what, for our fifth version of the story, uh, what we can come up and with. And we're going together. to try to be very different, right? Are right. we trying to be good or just different? Uh, just different. Okay. So, so we need a new genre. Okay. So we've done historical fiction. We've done fantasy. We've done sci-fi. We've done animal. Yep. Um, do we need a mystery? Okay. Sure. We can do a mystery. Um, who is the maternal figure in this case? Is it the detective? Oh, that one? Yeah. Let's, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That's an idea. What is a, it's a mystery involving a homeschool mom. Oh, there we go. Okay, and um, but who's so so so, so is this is like rural sort of mysteries, like like out in like I think it needs to be like Doctor Quinn, detective woman. Okay, yeah, I I can see that, and uh, they uh, come across mysteries sometimes when they're doing field trips or uh, hanging out with the homeschool group. Yeah, <laughs> wait, by rural by Doctor Quinn, you, is this a frontier or is this a modern day setting? I don't know. I was thinking, if it's homeschool mom, I was thinking modern day. No, let's do modern day. That'll be fine. To be but yeah, let's, let's like, we're in Nebraska or something. Okay, Nebraska. Yeah. That sounds good. All right, what's the escape here? Are we talking, uh... I think what, it should be... What's something different that we haven't done so what far? What if it's like, I mean, is this is this cheating to have escape being like, like the statue of some animal or person, like, has left the building? The statue? Like... Like it got stolen, but it's, I don't know. That's probably that, that's, kicking, that's, that's, that's okay. a theft, not an escape. Okay, fine. Um, um, but I guess you could say uh, maybe it's uh, they're on vacation, like they're, they're escaping their normal life. Oh, oh, that's true. Unless you think that's escape. Much, too much of a cheat. I don't think, no, I don't. I think, yeah, it's, it's still an escape. They're on vacation. Okay, yeah. Uh, except then there's a farmer. Um, maybe they're visiting. Uh, their grandpa, their, their visiting family. Maybe they're from Nebraska, but they're going down to like a dude ranch in Texas. Okay, sure. Uh, and that would, mystery... That'd be a rancher more than a farmer, but... Well, okay, fine. Or you could go the other way around. Maybe they're normally from Texas and they're going up to Nebraska. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so they're in Nebraska. And so what are they investigating in Nebraska? Corn. No, um... <laughs> they're on vacation, um... Yeah, because now we've gotten rid of all the stuff in the ark. <laughs> uh, maybe it's not actually a mystery. Well, then it just becomes a, f- a family drama, a which, family well, drama I mean, which it works I guess too. it could be. I like the idea of a homeschool mom solving mysteries, but uh, I don't know what the mystery here is in our setting. Unless there's an escape. You could do one of those things like someone lived upstairs in the old farmhouse and now it's gone. And Oh, that's kind of creepy. But, you know, then whether it's actually like a Jane Eyre sort of upstairs mad lady or whether it's like something that you think is bad but good, like Home Alone. Okay. Um, I don't know. Ooh, interesting. There's there's a couple of interesting ways you could go with that. So they're investigating this this missing person. Oh, there you go. It's it originally starts off as a missing person's case, but then as as they start investigating, they figure out that the person that the farmer, maybe the... Wait, okay, let's drop the whole vacation thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're investigating... It's an escaped Nazi. Uh, yeah, the, the, okay. they're investigating someone who escaped from a farmer's house, and they think that they think one thing: it's this crazy person that needs to be put away. But actually, this person is 
hasn't actually been treated well by the farmer. Okay. And so they... So they're helping them. They, yeah, they, they help. They find the person, but they realize they need to, to bring the farmer or this bring person... Bring the farmer to justice. Yeah, bring the farmer to justice. And we have the other we have some other characters around here, quirky, like, you know, that are red herrings. Some, yeah, there you go. Some grumpy old man and some... Some the, the nosy neighbor, yeah, who is behind behind, behind it all, all along. <laughs> <laughs> Very creative, Tim. Yeah, okay. <laughs> See, the hardest thing about being creative is, I think, using things from other places without imitating them, imitating too them too much. And that's yeah, the whole thing of tropes is tr- balancing the tropes as a as an aid as opposed to a crutch. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's fun to like mix and match. Things. Oh yeah, like I mean. This may be because I was homeschooled myself, but I kind of like the idea of a whole series about a homeschool mom. No, no, the whole the homeschool mom detective is great. That's all brand new. Yeah, like yeah. That, that's a that's a genre and a character that I think that could be really that fun to I've mix together. Yeah. No, I think I think that would be f- yeah. So okay, um, that works then. W- one of you uh, conservative filmmakers out there, uh, make that series. That'd I think be that'd be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that's what Ben Shapiro should be doing. <laughs> there you go. Because it's like you know, in the same way Father Brown knows all about sin from mm-hmm. all the confessions, whatever they. I deal with five young kids. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That'd be awesome. Like all you grownups are just the same. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so uh, that was fun. So we had five very different stories based on that prompt. Yes. So, okay, I guess that means it's time for our next prompt. All right, let's see what we got. We're going to hit the next button, and hopefully it comes with something interesting. All right, an anticlimactic arc featuring someone's daughter, which climaxes in a duel and involves a hat. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I like it. Du- so, so okay, wait. I just like I just want to read this again. An anticlimactic arc featuring someone's daughter, which climaxes <laughs> in a duel, involves a hat. Wait, it's an anticlimactic arc, but that has a climax. Yes. Um. <laughs> so here we go. I guess. All right. All right, Tim. So hats, duels. And a climax. You you want to go with it? I hear you laughing as you were writing over there. I'm pretty happy with this one, to be honest. Okay, we'll, we'll see if you think I played fair or not. But. Okay. <laughs> Two parents are concerned about their children's imaginary friend that has caused much chaos around their house. The kids, especially their daughter, say it's all good fun and that they've been learning how to read, but the parents aren't so sure. After a long investigation to find out if the imaginary friend is real, the parents find themselves face to face with the ultimate mischief maker. The cat and the hat. The father can't believe a feline of all things could cause so many problems, but he challenges the cat to a tongue twister poetry slam for his rights to hang out with his kids. Nice. <laughs> like that. So a poetry slam is a good duel. <laughs> for Dr. Seuss characters, especially. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the hat was the was the yeah, first thing. Went that into he went, went into it. It's like, all right, let's go for it. <laughs> all right. Mine I needed about ten more minutes to make Untangle the mess it became as I kept writing. <laughs> so we'll just go with this. Okay. I just started throwing things. Sure. And, okay. Yeah. Joey is in love with Archibald Prim's daughter. Archibald is the head of the mathematics department at the college and a renowned mathematician. Joey challenges Archibald to a calculus duel, <laughs> 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 knowing that he has a secret hat from uh, um, Joey has a secret hat from Archimedes that grants the user insight into all mysteries. However, as the duel begins and Joey is meeting Archibald toe-to-toe, Archibald suddenly walks out and leaves the town with his daughter. Okay, so wait, do they, act, they, so they don't actually do the duel? They start and then he just leaves in the middle of it. Oh. It's anticlimactic. Oh, okay, I, <laughs> okay, I get it. <laughs> and then the, obviously something would happen like, why well, you just leave and all this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I kept, as I'm writing, like, oh, there's got, I had all these ideas about why and everything, but I'm like, I'm just gonna, just gotta go, I go with it. yeah, I just gotta go with it. So, yeah, math duel, yeah. So, you know, I don't know what Archimedes is <laughs> in there either. <laughs> I just need a magic hat. <laughs> I'm in like this weird, like, Disney like realm right now, like, it's half realistic and half fantasy. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you've got something that's somehow anticlimactic and climatic at the same time, yeah. you gotta get creative. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the whole point of this? Exactly. This thing. So, all right, uh, we where do, do we go? Second from, one. How do we do a second one from this? <laughs> I got. I got to read this again because this one's just weird. An anticlimactic arc featuring yes. someone's daughter that climaxes in a duel and involves a hat. All, all right. right, take two. Here we go. Okay. 
Okay, mine I, th- I think is a bit more straightforward than the last one. Your mind's at least as convoluted as the last time. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> so that's what, what you can come up with in four minutes. Yes. It's very entertaining. Okay, so a group of musketeers have been vying for a princess's affections and are ecstatic to hear she's throwing a fencing contest with a grand prize for the winner. Certain that the prize is the princess's hand in marriage, or at least a kiss from her radiant lips, the musketeers train and duel each other feverishly. The final duel is an intense affair that shreds their tunics and the feathers in their hats, but one finally emerges triumphant. However, he is distressed to learn that the prize is not the princess's hand, but a brand new feathered hat. <laughs> nice. That's good uh, That's good anticlimactic hat. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I like that. All right, so another one I just started going in with, and we'll saw. Okay. see where it goes. I, All right. I hardly got done. Okay, Fortunato is a strapping young man in a proud city. Duels happen daily. If you haven't been shot at by at least once, how can you even call yourself a man? Fortunato, however, is universally loved and feared because of his father, who has survived dozens of duels and has a plate in his head because of the duels and the injury. Oh, Um, okay. Anyways, so he's never had a duel. Okay. Looking for a way to win his own respect, Fortunato wanders the city, and he sees a peasant girl being made fun of because of her foreign dress and her hat. Fortunato steps in to defend her honor, though he doesn't even know who she is. But the girl is offended that he would defend her and decides to duel him herself. <laughs> okay. That's as far as it got. Yeah, there's a bit of an anti-climax of the For him. Because, no, I, oh, then why I didn't write, I was going to write this, is that, and then he has to refuse because dueling a gir- girl wouldn't do him any good. <laughs> Okay, so okay, so they don't they don't actually duel. Was, no, was, and then it could be uh, beginning of a love story, I guess, some sort of weird Hallmark comedy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it was going exactly. <laughs> Interesting. What time period is this, or is this a fantasy? I couldn't. I I don't know enough about like Italian Renaissance history, but I feel like that's where I wanted to put it. But I don't know if there's dueling at that point or not okay yeah so we're it's interesting we kind of were close there in the whole dueling i think we both mindset. did the we both purposely did not do a normal dueling setting first time so th- this i'm like well let's go for it yeah i suppose we could have gone with like pirates or something uh, so we gotta make up one that's true we do so do you want to do something more Pir- traditional like pirates or we'll be another good duel something completely different you could do a debate <laughs> true we had already had a poetry slam. Yeah. We could have a dance off. A dance like guard at Gal- Garden of the Galaxy. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. Let's let's do a let's do a dance off duel. Um, dance off somebody's daughter. Okay. Is she the one? Is the daughter doing the duel? <laughs> Does she do the duel? The du- duel. Um, maybe she's dueling herself. No. Um, or maybe it's a father versus daughter sort of thing. Oh, interesting. Like to take the <laughs> the crown of best disco dancer from. <laughs> I feel like this is something from like um. Oh, no, you didn't see Milo Murphy where the parents try, I have to go do the 70s disco uh, roller skating. Okay. <laughs> no, not that. But anyways. Um, okay, let's see the daughters doing the dance. Okay. But why? Why? Um, and whose daughter? Do we care? Um, I seem like it should matter a little bit. A little bit. Maybe them. I suddenly, the- I suddenly want to make it like some sort of like god, like Greek god daughter, but I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> like the daughter of, of Zeus. Zeus, who, well, he has a lot of daughters, I think, <laughs> probably. Yeah. Um, All the daughters. <laughs> okay, so... No, but we won't do that, though. No, let's not, not do a Greek god. Okay. Um, is it like a high school dance? Like, is it the principal's daughter? Oh, let's do principal. I like that. I like the high school principal's daughter. Okay. All right. And she, it's a dance-off between her and the gym teacher, maybe. The gym, Okay. The gym teacher is like... You is like a washed up reality star. Okay. From a dance from like Dance with the Stars sort of thing. Okay. 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 And what's what's this to prove? Is it's oh it's like a students versus faculty kind of thing. Oh yeah, there the you idea? go. Yeah. So okay. Um, and you get I me mean, the hat is the crown of oh, the dance. Oh okay. The 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 homecoming dance crown or something, or something yeah, like yeah. that. Okay. How is it anticlimactic? I'm guessing the The sprinklers go off because someone starts a fire in the bathroom. <laughs> Okay, so there is no winner, basically. There is no winner. Okay. All right. It's the middle of some sort of weird high school musical. I feel like this is like an episode of a TV show, basically. <laughs> this is an episode of some high school Saved by the Bell thing. I should, uh, yes. Or it's the beginning of... A Stephen may, King may, Maybe it's actually... <laughs> maybe it's actually the whole story is about this washed-up gym teacher. Oh. So, so it's, it's not like, actually about the daughter. No, the daughter is just... Yeah, it's somebody's daughter. Okay. Um, and so... It's, I don't know, it's like right around in the center where it's like the down, the low point uh-huh. before 
he's basically been trying to prove like, yeah, I, I was I was on this this cool reality show and I still got it. I'm gonna prove it in front of the yep. whole school. And he's almost doing it. And then the And they're all like about ready to clap and like, oh, you're even you're even out dancing this like cool sixteen year old kid who's like well known for being the it girl. The it girl. Uh huh. You no, know, she was on Got Rhythm Seven or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Rhythm Seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but I think yeah, then it's like it's an arc for this gym teacher. And so the sprinklers go off um because there's a fire in the school and maybe and maybe he's maybe there's and an actual his tears. <laughs> 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 I was gonna give him a heroic moment, but then I guess it, the fire is not actually a big fire because then it'd be too much of a climax. Yeah. yeah. So okay, I was gonna give him a heroic moment, like maybe he actually saved people and and realized that people are more important than dancing. But I guess you could go with the, if it's anticlimactic. Yeah, I think then, this is a low point. And then somewhere after this, he like has a discussion with his mentor, and then. Then the heroic thing. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So, so he, long story short, does make it happy and then eventually he realizes it's not all about dancing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. There you I go. I kind of like that one. <laughs> yeah. Fun stuff. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed. Um, you know, I, I think I realized we forgot to mention um, a couple episodes back when he did Challenge Accepted, we had people vote on which was their favorite. Oh, yes. I should look that up real quick. You mean when we came up with our... Stories like Sad Hitler and Jazz Car, or Sad Jazz Car. Right, right. I think we really only, we didn't have very many people vote. Well, we tried to do it on Twitter, and... It didn't work very well. It didn't work super well. So, okay, between Gettysburg Parrot and Sad Jazz Car, Sad Jazz Car won. Oh, I like Gettysburg Parrot, but yeah. <laughs> between Madcap Space Monkeys and Old Sad Hitler, <laughs> uh, the monkeys won. Yep. Which actually, I and I like the Hitler one a little more, so our listeners, we're not on the same page with the listeners some. Uh, then the one... Who cares about Harry Truman? <laughs> uh, that one lost to the Vaudeville Vikings, which I thought should because the Vaudeville Vikings were fabulous. That was that was the best. That was the best one that evening, I think. Yeah. So that was uh, if you, if you want to listen to us uh, talk about, I think those were very much live brainstorming. If yes. I remember right, that was yeah. That was a lot of pressure. Like that was a fun what if. Actually, I think that was that was a challenge accepted. But it was a very oh, yeah. It was a very what if ish. Challenge That's accepted, true. but that was episode 113, I believe. So you should listen if you have not to that one. Yeah, that was you good. should. And uh, if you would like to to hear us talk more about overcoming creative challenges, we talked about writer's block back in episode 55. So that might be a nice dive into the archives that you might enjoy. We would love if you want to email us or something. If you want to take one of these arcs and come up with your own, we'd love to hear your creative stretchings. Exactly. I mean, this the what ifs is just a really fun way to like, yeah, stretch your imagination, creativity, muscles, give it a workout. Like any, yeah, any, and there's all kinds of like we should mention juxtaposition, creativity, like things like uh, Snake Oil, that board game. Oh yeah, it's very much like you just gotta say, what is this thing? Uh, you just you just try to sell it. <laughs> it's a complete disaster. Uh, yeah, a lot of those apples to apples type games, the ones that where you get to put a little bit more arguing for, for yeah. making your case. Yeah, it's a, along a similar line. All right, Tim, before we bow out, I'll give the info on my soundtrack. soundtrack and before then we'll, we'll before you do that, though, I do want to mention oh, okay. that if you want to subscribe to our podcast, we are available on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and Spotify. And uh, leave us a review and, and let people know about some of the interesting things that we do here on the podcast. If you want to give us a little description uh, and some nice five-star review that can help we would love it feel free to share the love with your friends and enemies uh anyone who might be interested in uh topics about creativity and storytelling and if you have anything you like why haven't they talked about this we're always adding to our list of topics so if you have something you were just dying for us to talk about we will write down and get to it in about four years <laughs> <laughs> you can leave uh, those ideas at derailtrainsofthought.blogspot.com um, or email us and uh, we will see it eventually. Our email address is derailtrains at gmail.com. All right, Tim. So for my soundtrack today, I had some trouble coming with the original one. I kept coming against stuff that we had already, I had already suggested or you had. So it went completely different. The Overcock Remix has this one hour competition every, I think every month where you get an hour and they usually lately has been some picture and you have just come with this thing. And there's this remixer called DDR Kirby ISQ who's been doing these one-hour competitions for a long time. If you go to his band camp, he has collections of 24. He calls it all in day's work of like 24 of these one-hour competitions that you can buy or 
donate little bits to. So you basically, in that one hour competition means you have one hour to make a song? Yep. Okay. And then like five more minutes to upload it or something like that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. It's like when we did that um, 24 hour film, film. competition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And DDR Kirby tends to be very chip happy ishness. And this was called Season of Bloom. It's a very spring kind of chipper song and thought it would fit both the the topic this month and also just the feeling outside. Uh, chipper so. chip tunes. Exactly. Okay. Chipper tunes. Chipper t- <laughs> Nice. All right. Well, I guess it's time we probably, I mean, it's been it's been fun hanging out here in the I, zone. I don't want to get stuck here. Yeah, it, and I, I know. It, it may not be a good idea to be stuck here I feel too a little long. disconnected from life now. Yeah. Maybe it's time to kind of re-enter the real world. I think that's a good idea. But, but it's been fun hanging out here with you, Nick. Yes, it has been. So I will uh, try to get back somehow, and all you listeners will see you later. This has been Nick. And this is Tim. Adios. Bye-bye.